Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Colmel, uh, and very pleased to be back uh, in uh, downtown, beautiful uh, White Plains, New York, at uh, World Headquarters for the New York Power Authority, and uh, to again be joined by my fellow trustees, Tracy McKibben, Mike Balboni, Judge Nikandri, uh, Dennis Trainer is uh, again joining us uh, via video. He's still hooked on Zoom. I'm sure we'll get him unplugged uh, by September. Uh, Dennis, uh, great to see you. Good and to see you. Uh, most notably, we're thrilled uh, to be joined uh, today in person uh, by our newest uh, board member and welcome B. Gonzalez to uh, the NIPA family and uh, the NIPA uh, board team. Uh, B. joins us from Syracuse, uh, Central New York representative on the recommendation of our good friend, Joni Mahoney. Uh, we're thrilled uh, to have her expertise, knowledge, experience, community uh, relationships, uh, you know, sitting uh, at the table, as well as uh, her perspectives in a long and distinguished career in the world of education, uh, in combination of SUNY Binghamton and primarily Syracuse University for the last uh, 36 years. So, uh, but who's counting, right, B? Who's counting? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trust me, I'm not. You know, I guarantee you I'm not. Uh, happy to keep going. So uh, as you'll learn, I've got a great organization, an incredible uh, team uh, throughout NIPA, and we think uh, a, a great one around this board table as well. So we're excited to uh, have you uh, join us and look forward to uh, your many contributions in the, in the years to come. So thank uh, you. Welcome. It's right. been one of the best onboardings I've ever experienced. With and boards. I'm sure you haven't gotten a better breakfast <laughs> than uh, Sheila put, put, put out uh, uh, for us today. So with that, uh, we'll uh, welcome Gil and the rest of his team who are uh, scattered uh, literally across the country, as well as the region, some of whom are here. Uh, Gil, Sarah, as I look on the screen, Eves uh, are uh, elsewhere and uh, zooming in and will uh, progressively navigate the hybrid model uh, in the months to come and uh, hopefully uh, collectively uh, be able to be back together. So with all of that, uh, confirm that once again, this meeting has been duly noticed as required by open meetings law. So I'm very pleased uh, to call to order uh, this joint session of uh, NIPA and Canal uh, Board. I assume we've all had an opportunity uh, to review the agenda along with the 1400 pages of uh, other materials. And so with that, I'd ask for a motion uh, to adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. As the agenda states, uh, as we typically do, we'll start uh, our meeting in uh, exec session. Uh, we'll do our best to maintain some pace and uh, get back into public session as uh, soon as possible. So if I could, uh, I'd ask for a motion to uh, conduct an exec session, excuse me, um, to discuss the financial and credit history uh, of a particular corporation pursuant, pursuant to Section 105 of Public Officers Law. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carried, and we are in uh, exec session. So. Thank you very much. We'll be back shortly. Everyone, uh, if I could uh, ask for a motion to uh, resume our meeting in open session. So moved. Thank second, you, Michael. Second. A second, Tracy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. Uh, we're back in open session, and as, al as always, no votes uh, were taken uh, during exec session. Um, we've all been polled uh, relative to any potential conflicts, uh, relative to approvals uh, to be uh, had here. Uh, unless there's any changes, I think we're good to go with all of that, right, Karen? Yes, we are. Okay. All right. Gil, uh, zoom in and uh, kick us off. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and good morning, trustees. Um, NIPA leadership and uh, NIPA staff. Um, this will be a team CEO report. Uh, I will start, uh, like as always, I will start with the scorecard and some update on our strategy. Uh, Eve's then will, Eve Noel will then talk about how we evolve our key performance indicators, our scorecard and our board dashboard to track our progress with Vision 2030. Uh, we will have a special guest, Joy Ditto, who's the president of the American Public Power Association, to make 
an important award. Uh, and then Lisa Wansley will uh, talk to us about our uh, scholarship, Future Leaders Scholarship Program, as well as our P-TECH uh, internship program. And, and to wrap it up, uh, Christine Pizzo will give us an update on our return to the workplace plan, especially now with uh, concerns about the, the Delta variant. So uh, with that, let me begin with my, uh, my report with the scorecard. Uh, this is the new scorecard that uh, we have uh, put together to track our uh, monthly. That we use this monthly, we issue this monthly, but this is really to, to track the day-to-day -day operations of the Power Authority. I am pleased to report that uh, all of the key performance indicators are green, meaning that we are tracking according to our plan. And that is the credit to all of the employees of NIPA and the Canal Corporation. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Good target setting. You like to be green coming out of the gate. So well done, <laughs> Gal and team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so some of the highlights. Um, preserve and enhance the value of hydropower. That's our st strategic uh, initiative number one. This is a, uh, you know, I, I visited the Niagara Power Project about a couple of weeks ago just to check where we are with our Next Gen Niagara Life Extension and Modernization Program. That's a $1.1 billion program between now and 2034 to really uh, revamp, modernize our Niagara Power Project, our flagship asset, so that it can serve the people of the state for the next 50 years. I've met with uh, Daniela Piper, our new regional manager there, and Trish Lombardi, our head of project delivery, and uh, they have reported to me that we are on track. In fact, we just finished the controls upgrade on unit 12 and we are uh, right along on schedule to finish this project. Next we slide. Really great press uh, over the last few weeks in, uh, in, in Western New York on all of that. So all the media you know, picked that, has picked that story up. Trish, I got a little airtime on at least one of the local stations that I saw. So it's been a great and you know, positive story. And I received uh, you know, multiple uh, comments and feedback as I'm out and about. So a yeah, great story for the region. Yeah, they, 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 the, the, the team, they, they've been doing a great job. So they're pleased to report. Next slide, please. Last Friday, oh, next, this one. Uh, also, by the way, Mr. Chairman got uh, really great press. Uh, we are going to be the first utility in the United States to demonstrate the use of green hydrogen and blending it with natural gas to run a power plant. In our case, this is a power plant on Long Island in Brentwood. It's a peaker plant. You know, these are the plants that are used at the hottest of the hottest days when demand for electricity is high. And this is important because we need to explore all of the potential technologies to decarbonize our power plants. Uh, green hydrogen is only one of the technologies we're looking at. We're going to, going to be looking at short duration battery storage. We're going to be looking at long or multi-day duration battery storage. Uh, so these are the kind of technologies that we will explore and see and then eventually use to decarbonize our natural gas power plants in New York City and on Long Island while keeping the reliability and the resiliency of the systems. Uh, very, very excited to do this. And uh, it, we will actually do this sometime in October and November when we will test the use of green hydrogen. Again, the first of its kind in the United States. Next slide, please. I was with the judge uh, last week, last Friday in uh, Messina. And one of the things I did there was to check the progress of our smart path uh, upgrade of our almost 80 year old transmission line and from Messina all the way to the Adirondacks. And I am pleased to report that uh, our team has completed about a third of this project and it is going to be on schedule to be completed 
for June of 2023. Great job by, by everyone under difficult circumstances, especially with all of the pandemic shutdowns uh, related and, and supply chain issues related to the pandemic. Uh, good recovery by the team and we are on, on schedule. So as you can see here, these are the kind of installations that we're making so that cleaner uh, renewable power from upstate can flow to the rest of the state, especially downstate. Next slide, please. Uh, we continue to work with our customers. Uh, one of our uh, strategic initiative is to partner with them and to help them decarbonize their own operation. This is the roof of the Jacob Javits Convention Center in New York City. It will be the largest rooftop solar and storage in Manhattan uh, after it is completed by uh, on March 2022. So Sarah Salati and her team are overseeing this project. Uh, this is We're doing this in partnership, not only with Jacob Javits, but with Siemens Energy. Next slide, please. The canals, we continue to reimagine the canals. Uh, if you recall last year during the pandemic, we quickly put together a program, we called it Staycation, so that uh, canal communities and, and New Yorkers upstate can enjoy the canals as a, as a recreation asset. And we have expanded that this year. We're calling it the On the Canals Excursions. Uh, it's already ongoing as we speak. It's, it started a few weeks ago. Very, very well received, overbooked. And we're just so excited to, again, provide recreational uh, opportunities for New York, especially for uh, New Yorkers along the canal communities. Next slide, please. Okay, I think that's it. And the next will be... Um, any questions uh, for Gil? Yeah, any questions any for of that? The initiatives that said uh, the Niagara Power Project, uh, you don't have any billion dollar investments no, in... No. Uh, Buffalo or Western New York or any region. So it's appropriately uh, gotten the recognition and the visibility that it deserves and the impact uh, it has directly and uh, indirectly. But I don't know, Judge. Uh, My questions on canals, uh, Gil, is that uh, I've had a lot of people approach me about the availability of accommodations and people that want to you know, transit the canals from one end to the other about the availability of accommodations along the way so that they, they can make uh, arrangements to uh, you know, do part of it and the next day do the next part of it. So uh, we ought to be teaming with the uh, locals on making accommodations available and to publicizing that. So uh, I think that's a, uh, something that we could partner with people and, and do some economic development along the canals as well so absolutely we're actually doing that ju judge in, in, in Amsterdam and and we're looking at, at other locations so more to come we'll give you specific update in future meetings about Good. the priority projects that uh was announced uh when uh, were announced uh, when when this initiative <coughs> was launched in January 2020 good point We'll yeah, I recall accommodations being part of one of the options that we um, included in the reimagined canal work, right? Wasn't it finding along the way That's different correct. ways to stay? Yeah. So. That's correct. Anything else for Gil? So I know that um, Gil used the glamping opportunities that are being developed along the canal. How is that going, if going at all? It's, it's going well. We have one in Schuylerville. <laughs> Uh, and, and part of this, the on the canal is excursion. So there are four or five other spots where you can do, uh, they don't want to call it glamping. Uh, the one in Schuylerville is glamping, but the rest are, are, are I would say, enhanced camping along with kayak. <laughs> <laughs> kayaking. Uh, it's with a partner uh, called Tenter, which is, by the way, a, a great company. They were founded in the Catskills five years ago. Now they are in 40 states. They provide turnkey camping uh, services. So we partnered with them. Uh, and again, you can camp, you can kayak, you can bike along the Empire State Trail. And, and so it's, it's a 
you know, it's, it's a good program, as I've said in earlier, uh, well, uh, you know, full reservations and, and people are really enjoying it. So we're excited and in future updates, we'll give you a more update on the other. Project. You're welcome to be our glamping representative. <laughs> for, I, mean, I know you're, you know, Boulder and I'm, so I'm good glamping. You can be our glamping representative and we'll start a glamping committee and you'll be able to report okay, back. There to you go. Okay. If I could add one more thing. Sure. So last year during COVID, because I, my husband and I, our boaters, we, we have our boat at a marina right at the mouth of the Oneida River. And um, there were a lot of people who just couldn't go anywhere. And so the marina owner and I put together these little trips, right? into the city of Syracuse. We set up brochures so the folks that were there coming through and stuck could go to the Erie Canal and the Historical Association and just try to keep people busy while they were stuck. And so it, it generated a lot of interest. And as a matter of fact, that particular marina won a national award for the way it hosted its people um, through that crisis last year. Great. 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 Well, you're definitely chair of our glamping. <laughs> that seals it. Yeah, it's locked and loaded. All right. All right, Gil, thanks very much. Eve, you're going to hand it off. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. So, once again, Eve Noel, SVP of Strategy and Corporate Development. And today, oh, same technical connection. difficulties. You're frozen again, Eve. Can anyone else, Gil, you want to pick this up and back to I will, I will. I will pick it up. Next slide, please. So this is just, again, uh, a, 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 a process by which we went through to create the appropriate scorecard and milestones uh, to check that we are on the right path for uh, in the implementation of our strategy, Vision 2030. Next slide, please. So as you recall, we have five strategic priorities and five foundational pillars. So each one of this, so we have 10, we have specific tactics and owners, deliverables and desired outcomes, budget, <clears throat> et cetera. Uh, so this is the way we manage our business and this is how we're gonna report out, not just to, to us, executive management and to the board. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, the scorecard is the one that we will use to check the health of our business on a monthly basis. Uh, that's, that's going to be, that's the one that I just reported earlier today. Next slide, please. Um, as, as, I've, as I've shown you before, this is just a little bit more detail on what we mean, for example, for commercial availability and the other KPIs. Next slide, please. Now for the dashboard, this one we will produce and present to you, our board, every six months. So July and December. And in between that, around October, November, as we usually do, we will have a board, a strategic planning session to tweak and to enhance, to make adjustments on our strategy. Uh, so that, that will be the cadence that we will have for you. Next slide, please. So, hey, Gil, you, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I, I wanted to um, just, just mention that sort of like the dashboard discussion is broken up into three components. One is, hey, our progress against the implementation plans, which you know Gil alluded to earlier. The second is our performance against the outcomes, which are the 30 measures that we specifically identified during um, Vision 2030. And then finally, the third component is are the big rock capital projects and our progress of spend against those um, big rock projects. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt, but I wanted to, to get into a bit of the details for you, Gil. Go ahead, Eve, if you can pick it up. Is this your, is this the and, last? And this is my last slide. Yeah. So right. and, and, and in the nutshell, and in a nutshell, what we designed is two sort of mechanisms for reporting up to the board, providing you a monthly pulse check on, hey, 
How are we doing with regard to our operations? How are we doing with regard to our people? How are we doing with regard to our finances? And then we have the Vision 2030 dashboard, which every six months provides you like, hey, we set these targets. How have we done against those targets? And that's it. Thank you. I appreciate it, Eve's Gill. Um, obviously, as a board, uh, strategy is top of mind and top of priority uh, for us. And given uh, all the team did to successfully navigate the operational challenges of COVID, we're excited to pivot back to uh, a proportionately uh, you know, a strong focus on the longer term view and uh, our key strategic objectives. So look forward to you know, these enhanced tools to help us evaluate and monitor. So uh, appreciate the efforts there and look forward to the continuing dialogue. Any questions for Eves or Gil on, on any of that? Been a source of running dialogue for us, so. It has been no question, but just again, I congratulate the team in putting this together and helping us as, a, for, as a, from a board perspective, be able to see the progress and the performance of the team, because which is, as we've always talked about, it's outcomes uh, and results that yep. we ultimately want. And it, and having a measure for you to do to measure yourselves and the performance among yourselves is important, just as important as helping us as a board be able to then measure management on how they're uh, achieving the outcomes and the results that we expected. So and, and, good work, and it's agile and continues to yep, be real time monitoring yeah. as opposed to just look back analysis. So, Very good. Yeah. We look forward to it. We're excited. All right. Okay. Uh, next, it, it, I'm thrilled to uh, have Joy Ditto, president of the American Public Power Association. Uh, in the United States, we have over 2,000 uh, public power utilities. She is uh, our uh, lead, and she is based in Washington, and she makes sure that we are uh, aligned and we are heard in in our policymakers, especially on a national level. But more than that, Joy, uh, let me transfer the uh, the mic to you to make a very important presentation. Thank you so much, Gil, for having me. Are you guys able to hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thumbs up. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, first, thanks again for Gil for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm going to present an award to your to the chairman, Chairman Como, um, and and thank you all uh, as members of the board of trustees of NIFA for having me. Gil suggested before I make the the presentation, which you're previewing right now, that I give you a tiny bit of additional background about APPA and um, and sort of our objectives, and then how NIFA is interacting with us, and then present the award. So I'm just going to take a few minutes of your time to do that, and happy to answer questions as well. Um, but APPA was established in 1940 in Washington, D.C. As Gil mentioned, there are over 2,000 publicly owned utilities in the country in 49 states and five territories, all but Hawaii, which is unfortunately where my mom and my stepdad live. But nonetheless, we're in all of the other places. And um, we have very, some very large members. NIPA is considered one of our largest members, as is Los Angeles Department of Water and Power which has 1.4 million customers, utility customers. Um, but then we have some extremely small utilities in Orlando, Oklahoma. There are 93 customers that that utility serves, for example. So a lot of diversity in our membership. 50% of those 2,000 serve less than 5,000 meters. Um, of those 2,000 public power utilities, about 75% are direct members of APPA. The rest um, you know, plug in elsewhere through state and regional associations that then plug in with us. We at APPA focus on the federal issues primarily. However, we occasionally will be asked to provide some, ex some expert ad advice or testimony at the state level or the regional level in very targeted circumstances and always at the request of our members in a given state. Uh, we do sometimes, one of the uh, examples of that is when, when there are municipalities or states looking at forming a publicly owned utility or selling that utility. Sometimes they, will, they want our expertise in that matter and sometimes we will weigh in in those circumstances, that's one example. But uh, our focus is 99% uh, at the federal level, and we have about 65 
subject matter experts um, working on your behalf in the Washington DC forum, this fun place up here. Um, so our offices are in Arlington, Virginia, right, uh, right by the Pentagon, right across from Reagan National Airport. So come visit us when you're up here. So briefly, our vision at APPA is to shape the future of public power to drive a new era of community-owned electric service. Our purpose or mission is to partner with our members to promote public power, helping community-owned utilities deliver superior services through joint advocacy, education, and collaboration. Um, and we really are focused on kind of five big buckets, and that also comports with our strategic plan so advocacy is a, a primary driver of why we were formed. And when I say advocacy, I mean regulatory and legislative advocacy, as well as some agency advocacy and advocacy in the media. Um, also uh, utility operations and technical services, including things like mutual aid, which I know NIPA has been an extremely valuable partner in providing mutual aid as far away as Puerto Rico. And so we, we, we work to coordinate national level events. We don't get involved with kind of the smaller regional and state level storms, but we do coordinate national level events and uh, across the country. Um, we also provide professional development and knowledge sharing, news and information through our publications. NIPA has been featured many times in our public power current newsletter and our magazine. And then we also focus inwardly and make sure we're providing kind of uh, looking at association excellence and some of the KPIs and things you were talking about with night, but we're also looking inward and making sure that we're providing optimal value to our members for their dues dollars. In terms of our strategic direction, um, our four big buckets kind of comport with what I just said, but advocating for public power. Um, one of the others is association excellence, um, but two are, are kind of um, in line with some of the things I've heard NIPA is focused on, which is promoting grid security and then moving public power forward. So looking at all of the utility of the future work, which I know NIPA and the state of New York is very forward looking in that regard. So um, NIPA has been a member of APPA since 1980 um, and a longtime member of our small R&D program called DEED, Demonstration of Energy and Efficiency Developments and has received, uh, over, uh, has received many DEED grants, eight in, in total since 2005. So, You've contributed to the program and received grants in return. Um, also, NIPA is participates in our Reliable Public Power Provider Program, or RP3, which is a, a program, a peer-supported um, program where public power utility peers evaluate each other's reliability, and NIPA is a diamond level, the top level RP3 designee. They are also, you all are also, we created a new program called our Smart Energy Provi Provider Program, which is a similar type of program where there's a peer evaluation of various elements. Um, and we created this program only back in uh, 2018, 2019 timeframe. And NIPA is one of our first designees of the Smart Energy Provider Program. Again, looking at some different categories, kind of in that public power forward element, the utility, the future elements, and the, the decarbonization pieces that I know you all are very focused on as well. So with that, um, I'll turn to appreciate NIPA's membership, appreciate your leadership of NIPA, and want to turn to an, another element of what we do, which is engaging with our um, the governing bodies of our members. So as publicly owned utilities, our members are governed by boards like you all, um, locally elected officials, mayors, city council people, um, and then again, appointed or elected boards. And we uh, formed a group a number of years ago to um, ensure that we were getting the perspective of our governing boards when we were coming up here to Capitol Hill and elsewhere in DC to advocate. So we have a group called our Policymakers Council, which similar to our board of directors has regional representation from across the country. That policymakers group, you have to be nominated by your um, utility CEO to be part of the group. And then you participate in helping us advocate on behalf of public power here in Washington. It's a very special group. And we, um, there is an award that was created a number of years ago as well to honor and recognize leaders in that group, those policymakers that we call 
the policymakers council, those folks who are leaders within that group. So that was that's already a leadership group, and then there are leaders within that group. Um, so I'm very pleased to say that your chairman, John Colmel, has received what is called the Spence Vander Linden Public Official Award, which again was created in 1984 to recognize personal service to APPA by elected and appointed officials. It honors Spence Vander, Lin Vander Linden, I'm having a hard time with that name today, of Harlan, Iowa, who is the first chair of the APPA Policymakers Council. So any elected or appointed member of an APPA member utility um, who's actively participated in APPA for at least five years is eligible. But again, a lot of the folks who get recognized participate directly in our policymakers council group. So again, appreciate so much and, and congratulations to John. We, we actually delivered these awards at our national conference, um, which happened in Orlando, Florida in person about a month ago. And we had a virtual component of the conference about two weeks ago as well. Um, so um, we are, he has received the award in the mail, but this is just to acknowledge that um, that, that occurred and he was recognized at that conference at both the in-person conference and the virtual conference. So appreciate again, his lead your leadership, um, Mr. Chairman, and again, the, the support of NIPA in the broader public power community. So with that, um, I'll turn it off. Yes, congratulations. Tomorrow we'll have another president. <laughs> That's great. Well, Joy, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your being here today to again present uh, the award. I can confirm uh, receipt in the mail. It was well delivered and is now probably uh, displayed at home. So thank you very, very much for the recognition and uh, consideration, Gil, uh, forever indebted, not only for the nomination, but obviously I accept this on behalf of all of you, uh, NIPA. Um, it's uh, not for me, it's for the great work uh, that all of you continue to do and the leadership uh, you uh, display each and every day uh, across this uh, industry. So it's been an honor uh, for me to serve um, the organization, this board in particular, talk proudly of uh, the great work we do and the great team we have and um, small recognition, but uh, very much appreciated uh, for the, you know, the tremendous uh, efforts uh, that all of you display each and every day, and I'm uh, proud to be associated. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, and Joy, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, congratulations again on behalf of everyone at NIPA and uh, the New York State Canals. Appreciate and thank you, you very, th thanks so much, Joy. Have a great day, thank you. And Gil and all, much appreciated. Mr. Chairman, I want you to know that uh, as I told you last night, uh, in another life, I represented uh, municipal <laughs> electric and uh, got actively involved with the power authority. And I think that activity was a prod of getting NIPA to join APPA. Ah. Uh, they were very helpful in my endeavors and my representation. And I think uh, NIPA brings a lot to the table for APPA and vice course, versa. Sir. APPA provides a lot of opportunity and knowledge and information to the power authority. So it's a great organization. Board as well deserved. Uh, very kind. Yeah. Very kind. of Gil's always, you know, talk proudly of uh, the work that the APPBA does and uh, American Power and our leadership in it. So uh, as always, incredibly proud of uh, all, all we do to help lead the way. So well done. Okay. Bye. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Great. Take care. Thank Have you. a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Joy. Bye. Thanks, Joy. Okay. Uh, next, um, just thrilled for, for this next part. I'm going to ask Lisa Wansley to talk a little bit about our Future Leaders Scholarship Program and our P Tech Intern Program. Um, just, just proud of this uh, program, proud of Lisa and her team. Lisa. Thank you, Gil. Good morning. So I'm Lisa Payne Wansley, and I'm the Vice President of Environmental Justice here at NIPA. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of the successes of our inaugural programs under our DEI commitment number nine, which focuses on STEM and opening career opportunities for young people in underserved communities. Next slide. 
So just to refresh your memories, um, commitment number nine focuses primarily on building a pipeline for future New York State energy industry employees. The first initiative, the NYPA Future Energy Leaders Scholarships provided 10 $10,000 scholarships to students across New York State. We did this in partnership with industry organizations and existing community partners. The second initiative under this commitment is the Pathways in Technology Early College High School Program, or better known as PTEC. This program is an IBM created innovative learning model, which allows eligible students who attend participating high schools to gain industry knowledge and experience through mentorships and a paid internship. NYPA will also assist in building curriculum by providing information on current and in energy industry needs in order to develop the students' professional and their technical skills. The result is an associate's degree in a discipline related to the energy and utility field. Next slide. So this year, our Future Energy Leader Scholarship awarded 10 students a one-time $10,000 scholarship to pursue a STEM-related four-year college degree. We did this with the help of five industry and uh, administrative partners, the American Associations of Blacks in Energy, the Eagle Academy Foundation, the National Action Council of Minorities in Engineering, the National Society of Black Engineers, and United Neighborhood Houses. The eligibility criteria were as follows. Candidates must be residents of New York State in good academic standing with a cumulative grade point average of 80 percent or above, reside in an underserved community, and demonstrate economic need. Next slide. Our inaugural 2021 class of scholars represented communities from all over New York State. There was one student from Western New York, two from Northern New York, two students from Central New York, and five students from New York City. And if diversity was one of our goals, we certainly achieved it. Out of 10 recipients, five students were of African descent, one student was Muslim, two were Asian Pacific Islanders, one student was transgender, and one was of Native American indigenous heritage. Here are the photos of each scholar and the captions indicate their colleges and their majors and their career choices. Students will be attending Loyola College Chicago, Columbia University, Fordham University, Nazareth College, Boston College, Mercy College, Cornell, and several CUNY colleges. Here today, we have two of the scholars who would like to share, briefly share their stories with you. First, I would like to introduce Malik Robinson, who graduated from Nottingham High School in Syracuse and will be leaving soon to attend Boston College and major in chemistry and environmental engineering. He's accompanied today by his parents, Robinson. Malik? Following Malik will be Fatimata, Fatimata Debo, who recently graduated from Claremont International High School in the Bronx. She will attend Fordham University in the fall, majoring in computer science, and she's accompanied today by her father. So Malik, you go first. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Malik Robinson. I'm from Syracuse, New York, as you've heard. Um, I went to Nottingham High School and I will be attending Boston College in the fall, majoring in chemistry. This scholarship means a lot to me. It signifies support for students seeking higher education and the betterment of our communities. I thank NYPA for this scholarship and I intend to do my part to show what a worthwhile investment it was. It makes me want to succeed so that I can give back to the youth of my community, wherever that may be. In the future, I plan to continue my studies through graduate school and possibly even a PhD. I ultimately want to become a chemical engineer specializing in alternative fuel and travel the world making a difference. Once again, I would like to thank you all for the scholarship and I'm very thankful for this experience. I'm the Holy Cross guy, BC, you know, I don't know, but, shaky, but a fine Jesuit institution nonetheless. Okay. My daughter's a senior at BC. She's going to look you up. You're going to love it. Awesome. Great, great school. We stop in Worcester on your way, all right? Hi, everyone. My name is Fatimata. I graduated from Claremont International High School, and I will be attending Fordham University. 
And for a start, I just want to show my gratitude to NECA. And um, as a first generation and my parents being immigrants and me being the oldest sister of 10 siblings. I still 10? have you beat. That's, that's enough. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot. Um, now you can imagine how hard it is for me to even think about like going to college because of its expenses. And um, college has been my priority since I was a little kid and NIPA just gave me an opportunity to even think about going to Fordham University. And I just wanna say thank you. Um, I've always wanna try like to be a role model to my community or people around me, especially my siblings. And I just broke this cycle since my parents never went to college and this is my first I'm a first generation and I just want to show my siblings that anything is possible and never just gave me that opportunity to like go to Fordham University and um, pursue a higher education in computer science and also get back to my community. I'm from Mali and um, technology is not really developed there. So I want to pursue a career in computer science. I don't know what that is yet, but um, hopefully I'll pursue on that path and give back to my community. So thank you, everyone. Congratulations. All right. Okay. Congratulations. Congratulations. Next slide. Please. Nine more to come, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. I told him he had a good start. Oh, exactly. we'll, be, we'll be ready. We'll be ready for you. Okay. okay. So since our DEI plan was approved late last year, we joined existing P-TECH partnerships in three high schools in New York State. The Energy Tech High School in Queens, whose college partner is LaGuardia Community College with an associate's degree program in mechanical and electrical engineering. B Solar High School in Buffalo, whose college partner is Erie Community College with an associate's degree program in computer science and electronics and the Oneida Herkimer Madison Boses in Utica, whose college partner is Mohawk Community College with associate's degree programs in cybersecurity, computer science, and mechanical and electrical engineering. So on June 28th, we began an all virtual internship program with teams of five students from each of the schools. Each group is led by a NIPA employee who serves as a project facilitator, and each student was assigned a NIPA employee who is serving as their mentor. Each group will work on NIPA specific projects and give presentations at the end of their internship. I would like to come back at a later date to give you a final update on how these internships went. But today I have one of the students, Adina Hasek, to speak to you. Adina attended Thomas R. Proctor High School in Utica where she joined the P-TECH program. And she recently graduated with her associate's degree in mechanical engineering technology from Mohawk Valley Community College. She will give a brief overview of her experience as a NIPA P Tech intern. Adina. Hello. It's so nice to see everyone. I'm great to be seen. As she said, I'm from Utica. So I, I have never come down here. This is my first time coming down here. We never let you go back. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. So I wanted to start off by saying that the internship has not only opened up many job opportunities for me, it has also introduced and taught me about my work life outside of college. When I was in college, I was a full-time student and I was also working full-time as well. So that was really hard to manage, especially in mechanical engineering. Sure. Um, but I, through this internship, it's actually showed me that, you know, after college, Working is a lot easier when you don't have when you don't have professors and you don't have so much homework. <laughs> um, it has given me a chance to showcase what I am capable of doing throughout not only the project but the meetings as well. The project we were tasked with consists of electrifying fifty percent of NIPA's fleet vehicles completely by twenty thirty. My group and I are almost fully ready to present this project, being able. Being able to access NIPA's databases for the fleets has been a great advantage in figuring out which cars should be replaced and with what electrical cars they should be replaced with. We actually, um, I have a mentor, his name is Brian Everett. I don't know if anybody knows him. 
Lisa doesn't know. <laughs> so um, he helped me actually access the database so I could see um, how far the cars are going from Cl the Clark Energy Center. And with that, I was actually able to see which cars I need to replace. And um, that's helped me a lot. My favorite part of this internship, if I had to choose, has to be getting to see the Clark Energy Center site or getting to be here today in front of you. The site was very interesting. I especially enjoyed getting a rundown of the control room and seeing how intricate and important everything is. This internship has broadened my eyes to different jobs I have never thought of looking at. I am more prepared to start my career than I was before, and for that I am thankful. Thank you for your time and for this internship. Don't let you go. I, sh <laughs> I should give you a little cautionary tale. Once you start work, you're going to be working for a long time. Unlike college, there's no four year limit. <laughs> so you're starting on a long term venture. So enjoy. Well, thank right. you. Well, I like working. I do like working. I just. I like being more hands-on, so I don't like sitting. That's my I will congratulations again. Appreciate Thank you so much. Yeah. It was a great meeting. Yeah. Great job. Congratulations. She'll still look back and wish. Wish she was, <laughs> wish she was in college. I said that. Exactly. Right. So it was yeah. actually Gil's idea to have these students come and address you themselves. And as you can see, NIPA's investment in their futures is absolutely a positive, life-changing experience. I'm very happy to be part of this. And the fact that NIPA has asked me to work on this is just an, a life-changing experience for myself as well. Thank you for your support and encouragement. I want to say a special thank you to the families for traveling with the young people and also my team for making the, this presentation, but the, both of these programs possible. Are there any questions? So just a great job, Lisa. Yeah, Congratulations to you. I mean, you're combining both the priorities for NIPA, which is exposing early um, education around technology, but also a more diverse um, workforce. So I just I encourage you to keep it up. Great. Congratulations to everybody else, but also congratulations. Thank you. For bringing this to life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Go do some fun things. <laughs> Wait, this wasn't oh, fun. Oh Wait. <laughs> Dean already said this was the highlight getting to meet the board. I mean, she said it was the best part of it. I'm going to try to see the eye sock. Yeah. Oh, nice. oh, oh, all right. Nice. That'll be a little bit fun. Far fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Lisa. Great job. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your stay. Congratulations. Go Eagles. Dad, thanks so much. All right. <laughs> Hey, Mom, congratulations. Enjoy BC. All right, Dad, well done. Okay. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Board of Trustees, for your support and your guidance. Uh, I think we're off to a good start uh, in building uh, the pipeline of more diverse uh, employees, not just for NIPA, but for the clean energy industry. So thank you again. Um, and now we're going to shift to uh, our return to the work. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that employs return, 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 return to work. Return to the workplace. Return. Return to work. No workplace. Uh, last Christine. Oh. W means last workplace. Christine. Okay. <laughs> Christine. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. My name is Christine Pizzo. I'm the head of HR and administration, and I'm giving an update about our return to the workplace uh, plan. We this just, workplace, really. this workplace, all the workplaces. Um, but um, throughout the pandemic, we have had our incident command structure and team help guide our decisions about coming into the workplace um, to maintain health and safety for our staff um, working on the, on the site and staff at home. Their role has shifted, and while they're still here to maintain uh, the programs that we have, look at the guidance, the guidelines, and monitor it, my team is working on developing the longer-term plan to increase staff presence in the workplace. So as you know, we've never stopped uh, coming into the, into the workplace, and over the past year, we've gradually increased the presence of staff throughout the sites consistent with state guidelines um, and maintenance of health and safety in order to uh, fulfill the work that we need to do, um, not only on the site, but um, at customer sites as well. Prior to the summer, about 75% of staff were either working full-time or part-time. 
So we always had, had a presence. Our summer plan that we are um, have introduced for um, June, July, and August um, is increasing the presence of staff that were working remotely um, up until this point. And they're coming in a minimum of three days every pay period. Um, again, consistent with um, the guidelines that are in place at the time and will always you know, continue to evolve around that. Our plan overall, so we have two phases um, throughout the summer, one in the summer and then one in the fall, is informed by benchmarking. We're looking at peer um, results information, local, national, utilities, agencies to see what their plans, uh, their plans are and what they're doing um, for the workplace reentry. Um, but our plan is also being guided by certain guiding principles that are informing our work rules and decisions. One, health and safety of our staff is paramount. So we're making sure that the um, conditions that we create um, within the organization maintain that. Second, um, we wanna make sure that we fulfill the needs of the business and getting done what we need to do, but also being cognizant of the, uh, the marketplace and maintaining our competitiveness in the workforce. We wanna support inclusion and make sure that we're listening to feedback from staff, adjusting, and then also creating rules that are equitable um, across the board. We also want to increase collaboration and foster collaboration. So really make those um, uh, times in the office meaningful when we are not on a, a, a remote a Teams call or, or doing things virtually that we really foster that collaboration and then agility. We wanna be able to pivot if we need to, um, if conditions change and continuously re respond to that. So our fall plan, um, we will increase the presence again in the fall. We're working on that now. The plan will be created with just the same sort of rigor that we've taken throughout the, this pandemic. Um, again, looking at benchmarking, listening to staff feedback, monitoring um, the internal workplace um, and the external market so that um, we can create a plan that's meaningful and that really brings everyone back to working together. I know we're all here together today. It feels so great to be here and see all of you and talk to you. Um, and we want that same experience for our staff to have them come into the workplace um, and get that same benefit of collaboration and collaboration and community that we want to foster in the organization. And we'll present that to you at the next board meeting in September. Christine. Um there's a lot that's being explored now and written about the psychological impacts of uh, isolation uh, for the period. Of, have we included in our program that type of uh, counseling that's available to our workforce? Yeah, throughout the pandemic, we have been focusing on mindfulness, EAP program support. Um, we've increased the number of um, um, uh, employee training around how to manage your workload, how to collaborate better, um, you know, at home. So we've had, we've kind of blended the mindfulness and being able to sort of cope with the at home uh, working to um, helping them with work rules and tasks around organization and management. So we have provided that, um, that support throughout. Was it utilized? I, at what extent was it utilized? Yeah, well, we had, whenever we um, uh, conducted trainings, they were full. Um, every every training was full when we, we did that about mindfulness. We had a great participation rate there. We do surveys at the end of uh, most of our trainings and sessions, and we continued doing them, you know, because we got such great feedback. Um, and we're, we had the support of Gil really kind of reinforcing uh, the importance of mindfulness and, you know, to be able to uh, try to be present uh, more and, and, you know, give people those coping strategies. So he's been supportive in that way as well. What's uh, our current position on the whole vaccination front and our messaging around that? Um, do we have a handle or what do we know in terms of what percentage of our employee population is vaccinated? Uh, where do you see that evolving? Yeah, well, um, I can pass that to Paul, but I'll say that um, our vaccination is uh, voluntary. We're highly encouraging them to get vaccinated. Um, Paul is our the head of our right, incident command. 
scheme. He is still maintaining numbers on vaccinations. We have many processes to track that um, and we'll continuously monitor as people you know, flow in and flow out of the organization. So it's a, lot, it's a living um, thing we're monitoring. So if Paul, if you wanna just provide some of that background. So from uh, the perspective is we have not taken a position where we mandate employees for vaccination as of yet. We're we'll keeping our finger close on the pulse of where the industry goes, both in the How government involved, sector right. and, and in the private sector and the utility business. Right now, voluntary reporting, about 60% of our employees have voluntarily reported that they're vaccinated. But based on uh, some data points that we have, we estimate that it's probably closer or approaching 80% of our employees have been vaccinated. We can't compel employees to, to report, but we know that not everyone is reporting for whatever their reasons may or may not be. So uh, we feel that we're in a relatively good shape based on the data that we have right now. Um, our infection rates, we haven't seen any bounce. I mean, we're- I'm gonna say after about six weeks of relative boredom in the COVID world, which right. are well just deserved the uh, respite, um, things are starting to pick up. So um, we have updated our countermeasures plan, which has been our guarding document. It's a living document, but we've updated it uh, to reflect, you know, the most current CDC, New York the State Department of Health, Goer, and our learnings from um, Delta right now. Um, as of today, we have two employees who were out ill with reported COVID. Um, contact tracing has been done, so that's done. We have two employees who are under investigation right now that they've reported signs and symptoms. And um, three of New York State's economic development regions are at stage one of our countermeasures. Um, Long Island affecting our Flint plant and our Brentwood plant. Uh, the Finger Lakes, which has relatively no impact on us. And uh, the Capital Region, which affects some of the canal sites and Albany. So we're keeping our finger closely you know, on the pulse of this. We monitor the data every day. I have a full team meeting um, every Monday morning. And we meet ad hoc as needed right now. And based on the countermeasures, as we see more and more disease, the pace and frequency of those uh, meetings increase. Um, and the main effort, the main work effort we have going on right now is we are pre-planning for testing if, if and when we either mandate testing for non-vaccinated employees or when we get to stage three in our countermeasures we mandate testing for our employees. So uh, okay. we're pre-planning for, for weekly testing of those employees who were or were not vaccinated and we'll see how that goes. Okay. So Paul, any any uh, uh, plans in the future to possibly use a, a, a vaccine uh, pass? Oh, the Excelsior pass. Yeah, yeah. like the Excelsior yeah. pass. Yeah. Yes. Do, we have that? do we have that money? <laughs> right. yes. We can have yes. that. Yes, sir. We, we got a special we on Excelsior that? pass? Yeah, we well. have the Excelsior pass yeah. and it will be integrated Good. in our plans. Um, right. We've discussed integrating it into our plans to speed up the processing of employees, right. guests and visitors. We just haven't gotten to that point where we think we need to do it just yet or as an inconvenience, yeah. but we support the Excelsior pass. And a matter of fact, as a point of information for everyone, if you re-update your data in your Excelsior pass, you will get another six months extended to your um, pass if you have been vaccinated. So where have I heard that? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. No, no, no. We did, trust, that, I, did that this morning literally. by the board members in this like room. A okay, well, oh. well, and then there's that. So I hope I hope the board has full confidence in in the ICS team that we have. Um, you know, the best interest of the authority, the best interest of the citizens of the state of New York, and our always our mission is to employ, you know, employee safety and continuity of operations, and, and we're going to do everything we can to ensure that even if I have to go back in control room myself, which will be a disaster. <laughs> All right. Thank you. If I read the paper correctly this morning, since I read it very quickly, um, the governor is now kind of push down decision-making to the county level, right? And so how does that complicate your job? Because we yeah. Your operation is across the entire state. It means we have a lot of reading and research to do, and that is um, on our weekly meeting. That's actually the first point on our agenda is what are the updates based on CDC, county, Department of Health, and whatever have you uh, guided. So, yes, we have a lot of reading to do. And, again, as a state agency, we try closely to follow the recommendations of the New York State Department of Health, but we, we're always more conservative than Department of Health, CDC, our countermeasures. As a matter of fact, you haven't been involved, but welcome to the team. <laughs> the countermeasures both look at the uh, economic development regions of the state and every individual county of the state. So if we see a flare up even in a county, 
that will trigger a certain okay. level of response. We have five different response levels, um, all the way from business as usual, which would be zero, to stage five, where we actually um, have employees living at the at facilities the okay. without going home for anywhere for two weeks to a month with all, testing. All you're done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks so a lot. the information that Paul and team gathers and assesses will inform the current and future plan and will adjust accordingly. But, but Mr. Chairman, you know, it, it, we always focus on the bad. So we're in the middle of a pause, right? So it's a, it's a moment that we should all recognize the fantastic work that everybody yeah, has done on this thing. Absolutely. I mean, we, you, we always assume that the worst, that the fact this authority has done, has performed incredibly for the safety, health and protection of our workforce during the entire pandemic. I mean, it's, it's a good time to just tip a hat and say, awesome job. Yes, I, guess. I no, agree. Of course. No, of course. Well done, Paul. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We're pleased to be back and hopefully we can uh, continue as a board. <laughs> Uh, the view is much better uh, here than on, online. So thank you very much for the great work because Michael just recapped. Okay, Gil, uh, are you yes. good with that? Yeah, ne to next. Pass, ready to pass the baton to Phil? That's correct. Phil, okay. uh, it's all yours. Phil, with uh, an update on your expanded <laughs> or expanding world of uh, responsibilities and opportunities. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, trustees, staff, and guests. Uh, my name is Phil Toya. I am the president of NIPA Development, um, and I'm here just to give you a brief overview of the group and uh, some of the projects we've been uh, working on and look forward to working on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so NIPA Development was formed earlier this year. Um, really, main focus has been on supporting NIPA's Vision 2030, um, in support of New York's uh, CLIPCA goals, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, we're right now focusing on um, helping NIPA become a, the leading developer, owner, and operator of transmission in New York State. Um, we're also supporting Vision 2030 by looking at preserving and enhancing the value of hydropower within NIPA, um, and also working with NIPA operations and other groups to pioneer the path to decarbonize the natural gas uh, natural gas fleet within NIPA. Um, the, the main focus to, to support those areas, really right now, the three areas are looking at new transmission for NIPA, um, the large scale renewables in, within New York State, as well as uh, developing utility scale storage. Um, so the main focus right now has really been on transmission. That's where we're seeing a, the bulk of the development. I'll get into some of the projects and uh, um, ongoing within New York State, uh, but we're also, again, actively engaged in the large-scale renewables and utility-scale storage. Um, next slide, please. Very high level. Um, the group was, the, the basis for the group was uh, the project and uh, business development group that was formerly housed under commercial operations. Um, so that group under Garish Bahal came over um, to NIPA development team Within that group, we have a project development group focused uh, mainly on transmission. We also have a project development group um, looking at the energy storage and utility scale uh, renew or large scale renewables. And then we have our licensing and development group, which is really supporting the licensing of, of the transmission projects in these projects. Uh, the second function under our group is the asset strategy. Um, that's headed up by Tim Zandes, former regional manager for the CINI uh, region within NIPA. And that group is really supporting development in identifying projects. Um, that's our um, studies and standards group. So they're out there looking, um, working with NIPA staff as well as consultants, identifying the projects that will enhance um, NIPA's portfolio as well as, um, like I said, uh, really help us meet Vision 2030 and the state's uh, emissions goals. Um, and then we're also supported there by a project management individual um, she came over from um, utility operations. So again, bridging that gap between the development group and utility operations. Um, we're also working closely with finance and, and legal, um, as well as other groups within NIPA to um, really competitively bid on these projects and, and develop the best projects that are out there. Um, the other part of the asset strategy is working with the utility operations and helping um, from an asset management perspective, looking at 
um, projects that will enhance the existing portfolio, preserving the value of hydro, um, and, and again, building projects that will, will support NIPA's vision. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the projects currently that we have underway um, within the transmission. We have Smart Path, which has been uh, discussed previously at, at these uh, meetings. Um, Smart Path Connect. Uh, so Smart Path, I'm sorry, is under construction. Smart Path Connect is in the licensing phase. Um, we're moving forward with that from an Article 7 standpoint. Um, Central East Energy Connect, formerly known as the Marcy to New Scotland um, reinforcement project. Um, that's the uh, project we're working on with LS Power. Uh, so that's also under construction. Um, two projects that are um, in the early stages, one from the competitive standpoint, um, Clean Path New York. Um, we submitted a, an, a response to an ICERTA Tier 4 RFP for Tier 4 RECs. Um, so that is in the competitive process now. We did submit proposals on that. Um, and the next project is in, in the real infancy stages, um, the Southeastern New York Public Policy Transmission Needs Project. That was an order issued by the Public Service Commission. It's in the New York ISO's hands right now. Um, we expect that to uh, hit the street sometime in August. Um, and that would be a competitive process as well. So NIPE is actively um, engaged in looking at um, that, pro that process, um, anticipating the, the um, introduction of that and putting together proposals for that. Um, on the energy storage side, um, we are supporting NIPA operations as well as other groups on uh, the North Country Energy Storage Project. Um, we're also supporting uh, the Brentwood Hydrogen uh, Development Project, looking uh, to, to support them in that role. Um, and 174 Global, which is a battery storage project um, that is to support Con Ed system. Um, and it's co-located on, uh, on our uh, Zeltman Astoria project. So uh, we're supporting that project as well. That was originated um, in the old commercial operations business development group carried over. Um, we're supporting that. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a map um, to give you an idea of the active transmission projects in the state, um, the locations and the scale. So right now there's five active projects in New York. NIPA is involved in three of them. Um, Smart Path Connect, Northern New York. Um, that's the green lines uh, running horizontally on the, nor on the northern portion of the state. Um, there's also a southern portion of that that uh, is being developed by National Grid. Um, Smart Path uh, is, is in construction. Those are the red lines um, extending from northern New York down towards uh, uh, closer towards central New York. And then the um, Central East Energy Connect, which runs from Marcy, um, the Marcy area in Utica, um, over to eastern New York in the uh, New Scotland area, Albany area. Um, so again, NIPA involved in three out of the five active transmission projects. Um, just kind of giving you an idea here. Um, those projects are really geared towards helping get the renewables um, that are being developed in upstate New York, get them across um, the Eastern interconnect, um, the Central East, Total East interface and getting them through that congestion so they can make their way down to New York City area. Um, you know, just very happy to be in this role, the support from the development team, utility operations, legal and finance. Um, we're treating these projects that we've been working on more on a project type basis. So we develop a project team, again, focused, um, the main focus being the development group, reaching out to utility operations, legal, finance, and other support groups um, to build those project teams, trying to, um, you know, remain aggressive and, and nimble and agile in, in the development of these projects and really putting together a, a good portfolio of uh, competitive projects um, that in, you know, enhance NIPA's portfolio and help NIPA um, and the state meet the uh, CLCPA goals and our vision 2030. So thank you. A lot of important, questions. A lot of important uh, challenging and uh, it's exciting uh, opportunities uh, for us. So appreciate you know, your, yes. your leadership and excited with uh, you know the carve out and the, and, and the team and the focus that uh, this appropriately uh, will receive uh, going forward. So uh, good work. Questions for Phil on any of that? Phil, the Judge. entire state line, <clears throat> is that built to reinforce the uh, uh, the resilience of, uh, of the transmission system, given taking off some uh, fossil fuel. Yes, that, that project was, a, again, a competitive process. 
um, night, but did participate in the in the bid. We, we were not successful in that. Um, but that was, again, to respond to the retirement of several fossil plants in Western New York. Um, they created transmission congestion. Um, so that project is to relieve the uh, congestion in the Western New York area, some of the underlying um, system, the lower voltage, 115 kV, 230 kV out there. Um, so that is to, to respond to that need. And that I believe is under construction as well. Anything else for Phil? Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Brad's up. Carrying the ball for Joe on the operations side. Hey, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Board of Trustees, NIPA and Canal staff, members of the public. I'm Brad Van Auken. I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations Support Services and the Chief Engineer. Uh, and here uh, today, I'm happy to be presenting on behalf of Joe Kessler, our Chief Operating Officer. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So um, uh, first I'll talk a little bit about our business unit uh, metrics. Our year-to-day generation market readiness value of about 96.4% is driven primarily by the outages at BG. Uh, unit three, as well as the Flynn plant, which uh, you were briefed on a little earlier uh, this morning. Um, these unplanned outages originated in April. And as, uh, as the year progressed, uh, started waiting a little more heavily upon this metric. Um, as you know, we set a high bar for our GMR target, and in the past, we've done a good job at meeting this. Um, however, this year, we unfortunately experienced two significant equipment issues, and that put us into the forced outages. However, the good news to report is that as of 20 minutes ago, um, we, did, we have returned the BG Unit 3 breaker back to service, and it was just it's uh, available for dispatch in the market. And I'd like to congratulate our team, our engineering team, project management the operations folks at the plants who worked very hard to um, get some creative ways to get this unit back in service and available for the market um, as we're still in the summer load. To hear, because I was just gonna say, we haven't had red in a long time. And I, I, I think it's notable that Joe had you do the presentation. <laughs> red. Very timely. <laughs> but as I'm asking the past me, even though it's red, our customer experience isn't compromised. No. Like this is red relative to our own standard, relative versus relative to delivery in the market. Exactly, um, exactly, Mr. Chairman. That's it. We set a high bar for ourselves. We right. drive ourselves hard. Right. I mean, just to put it in perspective, our plants in Niagara, St. Lawrence, our biggest, um, you know, the horses themselves are, uh, you know, well over our established right. metric. They're like 99.9%. Right. .9%. Right. So just to kind of keep it all in perspective of where we are, but yeah. it, we, do, uh, we do drive ourselves hard in this area. Okay. Um, the remaining metrics, um, we're all meeting or exceed our, our target, so uh, no need to uh, talk over about that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this one, uh, we wanted to give you an update on. This is part of our uh, TLAM program, the Niagara Switchyard. Um, and this is part of the larger TLAM program that was approved in 2012 uh, for estimated cost of $726 million. In early June, work within Bay 25 was completed, which included the replacement of three 230 kV breakers, six disconnect switches, two potential transformers, and various other uh, ancillary equipment. Um, this work required that modifications and replacement of the equipment foundations as well, which is significant work, um, doing a lot of uh, foundation work in an existing substation, very challenging. However, um, this work was also part of a larger program that continued on through the height of COVID. Um, we never stopped this program of our TLEM and um, kudos to our team again, once for just kind of driving through all this and keeping these large scale capital programs uh, moving um, for the reliability of our system in, in New York State. The overall Niagara Switchyard LEM is approximately 60% complete. So we're, uh, we're making good progress there, moving along. Um, next slide, please. And are you where you expect it to be? I, I see it's 60%. Yes. Like that where you expect it to be? Yes, we're on target and uh, on budget too. Uh, the next slide, this is uh, talk a little bit more, some of the details about one of the projects Phil just mentioned. And um, the Marcy to New Scotland transmission upgrade project was officially renamed to Central East Energy Connect, um, spanning across Central East load zone from NIPA's Clark Energy Center to new substations at Princetown and Gordon Road, um, while they will also continue on to New Scotland. 
This transmission project aims to unbottle the transmission congestion constraints and enable significant additional power flow transfer. Through NIPA's partnership with LS Power, construction began on this in the spring of this year, 2021, with our first milestone reached in May when we energized uh, the first five mile segment between the towns of Princetown and Rotterdam in Schenectady County. Works progressing from the east to the west um, and NIPA owned assets will begin in construction in 2022. And the overall project completion is estimated uh, for 2023. Um, NIPA and LS Power also recently completed a maintenance emergency response agreement that outlines NIPA's long-term project investment and role in maintaining all of the overhead uh, transmission assets facilities for this entire project. Um, the New York ISO has also filed uh, with FERC on behalf of the Power Authority for cost containment measures for the project. Um, with the specifications for the Marcy Switchyard finalized, um, the engineering plans, we're advancing the station upgrades at Clark Energy Center, 345 yard work, which will begin in early 2022. So for this fall, we have two additional outages are scheduled and we'll be able to complete another 11 miles of the project before the end of this year. Um, that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank you and end of my report. Other questions for Brad? Okay, well done. Okay, thank you. Thanks, very, thanks very much. Sarah. Hi. Yes, good morning. It's still the morning and uh, and a special welcome and hello to Trustee Gonzalez. I look forward to meeting you in person in September. Uh, as Chief Commercial Officer reporting um, under the operations group with respect to Vision 2030, feel particular focus and ownership over three of the five initiatives in addition to all the others as an EMC member, preserving and enhancing the value of our hydro, uh, supporting the responsible transmission or transition off of away from natural gas by 2035. And uh, last but not least, supporting our customers and state with respect to the clean energy transition. Next slide. When we think about preserving and enhancing the hydro, a couple, uh, there have been a couple of things that I've been focusing on the last couple of months. One is evolving our electricity supply strategy to be looking at our PL holistically when it comes to all of the power that we have to sell, either bilaterally through our contracts through economic development or other new supply structures that have been developing in the group or the, the unallocated amounts that are being sold into the merchant market. Uh, that being uh, said, uh, have uh, increased the capabilities of the group in terms of commercially and structuring those, and there'll be more to come, and I'm happy to share that with you at a future date. That being said, with respect to the merchant volumes, we are essentially on track by the end of the year, uh, only within 2% of what, what is expected uh, to support the uh, certainty uh, around our, our budget and the commitment uh, on our financials. Special uh, thanks to uh, Jenny Liu's team on the excellent execution of our volumetric supply strategy or volumetric hedging strategy with support in the mid office from risk. When we think about economic development, again, this is, uh, provides budget certainty for organizations across the state to invest in the economic growth and development of New York. They also provide budget certainty and financial certainty for NIPA relative to our bottom line too, as these as, as an example of bilateral contracting. That being said in the consent agenda, as a result of great work by Keith Hayes team, the key account managers and all of back office individuals, we have 15 new customers that are going to be taking down over 20 megawatts of power, uh, securing and preserving over 2,700 jobs and committing over a half a billion uh, into the economic investment in New York State. Next slide. With respect again to the strategy, uh, clearly looking at the outcomes that New York State wants from an energy policy standpoint, but hand in hand with that, I'm very focused and continue to be on the most effective delivery of that. I'm pleased to share that across all the products and services and business lines within uh, commercial ops, we see positive year over year PL trajectories. With respect to clean energy solutions, a special uh, shout out to Dom Lucci and his team uh, for executing on over $200 million in capital projects annually, as well as the key account managers 
that support the development of the pipeline, which fundamentally are going to supporting the state's 185 trillion uh, BTUs reduction in the next few years. On e-mobility, there is one yellow there, but fundamentally uh, it's very much on, on track. The, the number four uh, represents those charges that have been fully commissioned. We do not put anything on the scorecard until they've been uh, commissioned and operational. And we have a, over a hundred uh, chargers that are currently in construction that we anticipate will be online by the end of the year. So we'll be uh, very close to the, the annual uh, commitment of 124 charging ports. A couple of highlights there, we've seen increased util or higher, over 50% higher utilization than anticipated of our charging network. Uh, which is great because that's supporting again the electrification of the system and we have also uh, seen great partnerships with stewards and marabito in terms of uh the uh the public private partnerships in, in developing these projects and then and that's a special uh a recognition to fabio and his uh, lean mean team and then under emily bolduck the last line uh, again well ahead of our our targets to date um couple of things to highlight there. Uh, docs, the, the Department of Corrections and uh, Community Services just finished um, commissioning over 20 megawatts of solar. And uh, when it comes to New York Energy Manager, we have a contract with JFK where we are uh, censoring 14 of their buildings and providing them energy management services. Uh, and that's that slide. And finally, as I said, fundamentally looking to execute on our Vision 2030 strategy and to do it in the most cost effective um, and efficient way possible, looking at driving increased revenues from products and services that our customers want uh, and having it have an impact on NYPA's bottom line for its continued financial viability. And at the same time, again, improving our, our margins across all of our customer uh, business products and services by driving continuous improvement. You'll see here with clean energy master plans, it's an example of the evolution of our products and services, looking at integrating and providing even more holistic advisory services, pulling on all the technologies that we have at our disposal and elevating our relationship with our customers to a strategic level, even more so than we have today. Secondly, uh, in working towards a virtual power plant and having 25 megawatts by 2025 controllable load. Again, taking all the technologies that are behind the meter, we have partnered uh, with uh, R&D and I have a pilot at the White Plains office where we are participating with the Cadenza Energy Storage project in responding to demand response or more specifically dynamic load management. Uh, so we're taking the learnings there as well as the uh, as well as the uh, product development discipline that has been incorporated into the commercial ops group over the last uh, year in order to iterate and provide the grid flexibility services that again provide our customers with value as well as NIPA. And then finally, like I said, um, looking at continued delivery of efficient and effective processes uh, to ensure that we're getting rid of waste. Mike Quantinens uh, is working on this and he's embedded in engineering and construction management. And it's a great partnership between the existing project managers and engineers where they're being empowered through the discipline developed by Toyota and other, um, other organizations historically around lean uh, and agile. Uh, to, to identify ways uh, to make their jobs easier and to eliminate waste. Typically, the cycle time is about a year, uh, so we have to wait um, for a, a little bit more time to get a statistically significant uh, sample size to, to fully track the results. But again, great work done by Dorendi and his team, by uh, Emily and Sangita in driving the VPP, and then again in ECM. Um, with Keith and, and Dom and Mike Hugh with continuous improvement. So that is my report. Uh, great progress really across the board when it comes to, again, preserving, enhancing our hydro and driving more sophisticated uh, electricity supply offers and then behind the meter with products and services that our customers want and that will also deliver on our clean uh, energy transition. Any concerns you have, uh, Sarah, as you look ahead, your crystal ball, the balance of the year or out in early 22, anything that's going to get your way or 
anything we need to ensure you have the right access to resources and support to continue the, the positive uh, trend and execution here? Well, I think um, you know what, what's what's really positive about Vision 2030 and the dashboards and the initiatives that that Eve's put together and that you will be seeing at a regular basis. It really enables the executive management team to align on the key outcomes and on the key work streams on on an annual basis. So, what I look forward to is um, you know finishing to present the electricity supply strategy and have that get embedded. Into the um, into the Vision 2030 dashboard and tactics and initiatives, such that the organization can holistically uh, align behind it and execute on it. Because we know with NIPA, um, once we we have our enterprise, we we deliver incredibly effectively. So nothing nothing in particular. The the the, the, the reality is that we have a market that is evolving, and we have to evolve right. with it. We have to be agile. We have to pull our support services. To, to, to support the products and services that we want. And we have to be uh, continue to be creative and evolve in particular, our electricity supply offerings that both act as a defensive and offensive uh, play relative to preserving and enhancing the largest, uh, the largest con con contributor to our bottom line still. All right, well, great. One um, more Go ahead, Trace. Sorry, one question that I had, Sarah, is, you know, and great work on looking for solutions around providing, whether it's electricity or storage options. There had been a little softening around the energy efficiency work that your team was doing, obviously, you know, as a result of the pandemic. And, and the team, you and the team and, and, and as well, working with Adam have come up with very good, innovative ways to help our customers finance energy efficiency projects. Are you seeing an improvement in our pickup and interest in pursuing some of those? Um, if, you know, again, or is it, it was a little bit of a concern. Yeah. Are you starting to see any plans for a recommitment to those kinds of projects that you yeah, so I mean, for sure, the COVID had a had a pretty much a, a full stop and halt by many of our the larger government agencies, and there was is concern or was concern around their their budgets. Again, I think what what's great about what we're doing relative to the financing options is is by moving um, these potential loans off of the balance sheet. The the um, the sky is the limit in terms of what arguably could be financed and, and NIPA's um, own balance sheet is not in any way capping that. Uh, again, we're putting it in front of our customers uh, and their attractive rates, their fixed rates. And uh, so, so I think that uh, we, are, we are seeing the fact that the financing options will be just as attractive as the ones they've had in the past, if not more attractive. And so that in and of itself relieves any concern around purely financing. And then again, um, with COVID, with the pause, we'll have to wait and see. You know, we have seen some level of pickup and look, the CLCPA is, is a law and uh, we're looking at supporting our customers delivering on that in, in the most effective way possible. And, and that's why we're elevating our strategic um, relationships with them. So it, we haven't, it's picking up, okay. um, but it's, it's not good. back to the full force it was prior to the pandemic. Great, good to hear. Cause I do think this is an important part of the work. In addition to creating and producing energy, we also want to you know, reduce the demand for that energy. So that energy efficiency part is also an important part of the work that you guys are doing, so. Thanks. Any other questions for Sarah? Okay, thanks very much, uh, Sarah, well done. Adam, uh, we seem to be tre trending as expected and directionally on plan, so. Yes, I mean, it's all, it's all good news in terms of being on plan and on budget um, through six months, these are the actuals. So our actuals are, are basically hitting the mark on the revenue side, generations below slightly because of uh, lower than originally uh, forecasted hydro flows out of Niagara uh, primarily. But again, it's, it's, it's pretty close on to our year end forecast. We'll, yes, we'll bounce back. We, we, need some, we need some rain dancing. Um, transmission revenues are ahead of target. Uh, from the fax revenues, which is a, a revenue we get based on congestion and congestion pricing through the transmission system that is run ahead of what was previously forecasted, um, as well as uh, 
Uh, other transmission revenues we'll see towards the end of the year also will be trending up. Uh, margins in, in the non-utility, some of that is energy efficiency and some of that is uh, Evolve and some other uh, energy storage projects. And some of that is more of a timing issue in terms of when those uh, revenues will be realized. We're hoping that will uh, narrow towards the end of the year. Again, it's uh, all told we're we're uh, net net tracking towards the plan. Operating expenses are also tracking lower. Um, the one thing that's you know sort of kind of uh, masking that a little bit is the allocation of capital, which is based on the the rate of spend on our capital. Uh, programs and we do see that also catching up towards the end of the year so we'll see a little bit more on the ex, uh, operating expense side uh, between now and the end of the year but overall everything else is tracking through six months the next slide please we'll go to the end of the year <clears throat> so at the end of the year uh, again all the themes continue to carry forward as you can see the transmission revenue is even higher that's because our uh, new uh, transmission revenue requirement is been uh, figured out in the month of June, and it starts from July 1st to June of next year, and that is higher than what was originally forecasted. So we see some of that between now and the end of the year, and it will carry into next year. Um, margins on utilities still uh, where they were slightly better, and uh, expenses coming in uh, somewhat under. And again, tracking to plan. What I want to call everyone's attention to is that when we do the low case, high case range, we're showing, you know, not too much on the lower case. We don't see a big risk of coming in much lower than where we're projecting, but we do see an opportunity to do uh, somewhat better than forecast by the end of the year. And some of that is going to be the result of the bending the cost curve initiatives that we're doing and some of the work around the OPEB expenses which is referring to the post-retirement medical health costs based on the merger of the canals and the Medicare Advantage. As soon as we get some confirmation from our actuaries and outside auditors, we'll be able to sort of book those in the, hopefully in the third quarter. And we, we are expecting to see some benefit from the pension expenses this year based on the performance of the state pension system. Um, but other than that, we're, again, we're tracking well between now and going into the end of the year. And Adam, as you look at that spread between the low, the, the low and the high, I assume your belief is that we've worked through all of the COVID impacts that that's well in hand in terms of expenses. I mean, obviously all dependent on the, whatever happens with the Delta variant, but you're, that's, that work has been done and is behind us in terms of recouping and all of that. that that's correct. Okay. And we're working with the state. Uh, you know, we are a, a subrecipient to them in filing for FEMA, unlike our other FEMA initiatives like Puerto Rico and others. So we're going through the state and we'll be subject to it, however the state files and we're um, working closely with them to put our claims in and make sure that we get what we're entitled to get back. But we're gonna be conservative and make sure that we're not exposed. And OPEB and, pen, OPEB and, pen, OPEB and pension are taken out of the operations world. I mean, your operational band's fairly tight at this point. You're feeling yes. really good about where we are and where we're going. So yep, that's, absolutely. Great, that's great news. Great to be back on a you know, more predictable steady course. So. Absolutely. And as Sarah was mentioning in her report, because of the hedging program and everything we're doing there, again, there's a lower volatility in that area. And that's what we're trying to get to, something where we can plan going forward how much cash we're generating from the business so that we can continue to finance the large capital investments we're going to make in transmission and Niagara and these other major capital projects. That predictability. Good work. Yes. Nice to see the you know, results there. So. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we've had, uh, well, what, 10 days, two weeks ago, we had uh, finance and risk as well as audit committee meetings earlier uh, today. Uh, we had a cyber and physical security meeting. So at this point, um, I'll ask, uh, each of our chairs to report out uh, the actions and activity of uh, those discussions. And first up, Tracy McKibben, chair of the Finance and Risk Committee. Great, thank you. As you said, two weeks ago on July 15th, uh, we had a Finance Committee meeting. We adopted minutes. We received two uh, staff reports. Um, and then there are five items that we adopted and that we're now presenting before the full board of trustees for adoption. 
The first is a recommendation for the trustees to adopt the energy efficiency revenue bond resolution. Next is the recommendation for the trustees to approve executing an agreement to purchase renewable energy credits made available to the authority by NYSERDA starting in 2024. Uh, third is the recommendation for the trustees to approve capital expenditures in the amount of $595 million for the Smart Path Connect project that we discussed earlier. Um, recommendation, and then the uh, next is the recommendation for the trustees to approve a modification to the finance um, term for projects under the Energy Efficiency Program to allow uh, for maximum cost recovery period of up to 30 years, and that's changing it from the previous 25 years. And then final is a recommendation for the trustees to approve the revisions to the Finance and Risk Committee Charter, which is really just to add the risk element to that. And I now ask for a motion to adopt the um, above five items. So moved. Second. That was, thanks, Dennis. Court call for the vote. Any other questions? I know a good discussion in the committee meeting, but anything else uh, from anyone? Otherwise, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion uh, carried, and uh, as always, appreciate your leadership and uh, the good work of the committee, Tracy. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, uh, cyber and physical security. Our yes. house is secure. Uh, yes. So, uh, or so we hope. Uh, so, catch uh, us up. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, today the Security Committee heard about uh, NIPA's cybersecurity posture and a response to the numerous high-profile cybersecurity incidents that have been reported in the media as of late none of which, happy to report, have impacted NIPA. NIPA's cybersecurity team continues to monitor the threat landscape in close collaboration with industry, state, and federal partners and make adjustments to its cybersecurity posture to keep pace with current and emergency emerging threats. And against this backdrop, they've adopted the, the profile of benchmarking against best practices and while having collaboration, communication, and collective defense. It's uh, really the state of the art in terms of the best you can do in this environment. We also heard about NIPA's site visit and inspection activities pursuant to New York State Executive Law Article 26, which mandates periodic security reviews of the energy chemical pipeline industries and a report out of the effectiveness of security regulation and practices. We were also updated on the briefing between NIPA Canals Security and Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency of the Department of Homeland Security. These partnerships are considered essential to continue development of the NIPA security program to protect both NIPA and canals. The only other comment is that I was a proud participant in the original development of that whole program when I was in the legislature. So it's great to see that it still continues. There's still resources being done. And um, I really compliments the team for doing really good work and having a constant uh, approach to this. Great. Any questions for Mike? Anything else on the Excelsior Pass before we move on? <laughs> I, I, I urge working. all New Yorkers to download it and utilize it. it. Okay. Uh, and as I referenced earlier, two weeks ago, we also had an uh, audit committee meeting uh, did, chaired ably by the judge. July 15th, the committee met and received an internal audit update for the uh, 2021 audit plan from Angela Gonzalez, the senior VP of internal audit. And in the consent agenda, the updated audit committee and internal audit charters were presented. The audit committee approved the audit committee and internal audit charters. The committee made a motion to recommend adoption of the charters to the full board. <clears throat> That's before the board today. And I would ask for a motion. I would make the motion to uh, adopt uh, those charters as amended. Have a second? Second. Thanks, Mike. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Okay, uh, our last uh, item is the uh, consent agenda of which uh, there was a uh, typical uh, volume of information that I'm sure you've comprehensively uh, reviewed and we appreciate your efforts in doing that. Uh, if I could ask for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, before I call for the vote, uh, Sarah mentioned earlier in her report, uh, there was upwards of uh, 15 uh, awards and significant impact, but uh, I was told earlier we've got a, a late breaking development and a press release to be issued. I think we're expanding our reach a little bit. Dave Work uh, has a couple of comments on that. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dave Work, uh, Senior Director of Contract and Program Operations. I'm here on behalf of Keith Hayes tonight. Uh, before we get into the allocations, just wanted to talk about some changes we had to the New York, Recharge New York State legislation. Um, as you know, the Recharge program is made up of 910 megawatts of local power. Half of that's hydropower, half of that being market power. That power is further broken down into buckets, one of which is a 100 megawatts that have been capped for small businesses and not-for-profit corporations historically. Small businesses and not-for-profit corporations typically have the largest job and capital investment accounts uh, per megawatt, but they're also the smallest internal bucket, which has been nearly allocated for several years now. This group of customers, for reference, accounts for 200,000 jobs or over 200,000 jobs and over 9 billion in capital investment, <clears throat> nearly half of our program uh, as far as jobs and CapEx, but it's only about 10%, just about 11% of the total program as far as megawatts are concerned. Um, so historically, this has required us from time to time to hold applications uh, till powers turn back in. Uh, so recently, we requested a change in law to shift an additional 50 megawatts, you know, reallocating internally into that bucket from the large business bucket. Um, that's going to allow us to make meaningful allocations, return the greatest economic development to the state of New York. That change was recently signed into law. Uh, and on behalf of NIPA, I would like to thank the governor, as well as Assemblyman Steve Stern and Senator uh, Sean M. Ryan, who sponsored the bill. So good news all the way around on that front. Great. Super. Um, so we have uh, several noteworthy recharge New York allocations this meeting. Um, Cree out of the Mohawk Valley, uh, we're recommending them uh, as part of the, uh, the materials in front of you for 11.9 megawatts. They're going to create 320 new green jobs as a result of that and over 500 million in capital investment. Another company, Intergro Holdings Incorporated with Finger Lakes, uh, they're getting recommended for 5.8 megawatts uh, with total of 85 jobs committed and 8.5 million in capital investment. Um, Bond Secador's Charity Health System, 1.2 megawatts, 1,800 uh, retained jobs, and more than $5 million in capital investment. Um, moving on to the Western New York Hydropower Program, we have Polymer Conversions out of Erie County. They're getting recommended for 300 kW. It's going to be 165 jobs committed, 10.5 million jobs in capital commitments, uh, or 10.5 million in capital commitments. Last but not least is Cermac Ceramics out of Erie County. We're recommending them for 640 kilowatts. They're gonna provide 320 jobs and 13 million in capital investment. I'll take any questions. All of which is included is that in the consent agenda for which we had a motion and a second, unless there's any other questions, a call for the vote, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed Aye. consent agenda carried. Thanks very much, Dave, for the editorial commentary as well. Thank you. Uh, unless there's any other matters to come before us, uh, that completes our uh, agenda uh, today. As I said before, it's great to have most of us uh, back in person. It was great to see everyone face-to-face uh, -face again. appreciate uh, all the efforts for the last 18 months to keep us safe and healthy and more importantly, operational and uh, effective. So kudos once again to Gil and uh, the entire team and organization. And I'll be Happy to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. So, Tracy, second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The meeting is adjourned. We're back uh, September 30th as our next go round. And uh, if not before, look forward to seeing everyone uh, then. Enjoy uh, the rest of a sunny summer. So, and once again, be uh, welcome. Hopefully, you enjoyed your first gig, and we look forward to many more. So. Thanks so much for being here. Great meeting, yeah. award-winning chairman. Award winning. Chairman. Yes. Award winning. Thank Thanks. you very much. <laughs> All right, have a great day, everybody. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. you.